No, it's not like ice in your refrigerator. The molecules of water that are in the ice in your refrigerator are kind of all jumbled up. But if you form ice under very high pressure, then the water molecules can become ordered. They can become aligned. I can show you a crystal that is a very good analog to I7. This is halite, also known commonly as uh, rock salt. I7 may exist within our own solar system. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, could possibly have a mantle of liquid water surrounded by a thick, icy crust. The pressure from the crust is so great that I7 might exist deep within these uncharted seas. If we scale up and thaw out Europa, it could be a water world similar to Gliese 581c. One could imagine that life could emerge on a water world. After all, water is essential to life on Earth. Everywhere on Earth where there is water, there is life. You cannot find a sterile drop of water on Earth unless you put it in the microwave yourself. On this water world, there could be bacteria or any kind of life in the ocean itself. But not all of the super-Earths are water worlds teeming with life. When we talk about super-Earths, we talk about two major families, uh, mostly rocky with some water, and uh, mostly water with an endless ocean. But one has to add to those a third family of probably very rare super-Earths and Earth-like planets, which uh, are called carbon planets. A carbon planet is unlike anything we've ever seen anywhere. A place with an alien chemistry, but loaded with very earthly treasures. Throughout our galaxy, there are planets barren and poor and inhospitable. But science is on the trail of a new type of planet, an entire world of treasure. In our own solar system, in our sun and in all the stars nearby, there's always more oxygen than carbon. But if we think of a place in the universe where there's more carbon than oxygen, then planet formation is very different. Spectral analysis shows carbon to be far more plentiful 26,000 light years away near the center of our galaxy. Planets that form here may contain a rich abundance of carbon. The morning sky on a carbon world would be anything but crystal clear and blue. I'm picturing a yellow haze with black clouds of soot. And as you descended farther down in the atmosphere, I could imagine lakes that were made out of compounds like methane or gasoline. I'm picturing these bubbling, foul-smelling pits of black ooze, like an oil well. With little or no water in the atmosphere, the air is made of carbon compounds. Methane, butane, pentane, benzene, all these different kinds of carbon compounds that separate out when you refine gasoline. One day it might be raining benzene. The next day it might be raining butane. Alien as carbon planets might seem, the air quality could be familiar to some. The air in a very benzene-rich planet will resemble that of LA. A lot of smog particles that unfortunately we are quite used to from the exhaust of cars. Despite the pollution, carbon planets could come with a sparkling upside. You might see diamond because the planet may have substantial quantities of pure carbon that it's formed out of. Then pure carbon, when you compress it, tends to form into diamond. The secrets of exotic planets like these are waiting to be discovered all across the galaxy. But astronomers won't be satisfied 
until they find the Holy Grail. A planet like our own, one that sustains life, the next Earth. People always ask me, do I think we're going to find another planet like Earth? And I answer, absolutely. Every star probably has planets roughly the same size as our Earth. We think that essentially every star has several Earth mass or super Earth mass planets. So if you have, say, 200 billion stars in the galaxy, that may mean there are 400 billion Earths in the galaxy or more. 400 billion Earths. The Kepler Space Observatory is the first instrument capable of finding one of these planets. Kepler is looking at the constellation Cygnus in the night sky at 100,000 stars, taking picture after picture after picture, minute after minute. And the goal of Kepler is simple, to look for stars among the 100,000 that dim. When a star dims slightly, it means a planet passes in front, blocking some of the light. How long the star dims and how much light gets blocked will tell scientists about the size of the planet and the distance from its sun. A good analogy for this is looking for the dip in the light that you would see from a searchlight if a small moth flew across the searchlight. And so it's a really tiny dip in the light as the planet transits. It is a very powerful technique because it allows you uh, to uh, discover planets that are even smaller than the size of the Earth around stars similar to the Sun. It is a technique that is changing the course of science. We think we may be able to find a planet that is habitable in the next few years. Scientists estimate the Kepler mission will find a minimum of 50 alien Earths. One of the big questions that anybody looking for life beyond the Earth is facing today is what if we don't recognize life even though we discover it? Conditions on an alien Earth may cause life to evolve differently. My hope is that we'll see some sign that will make our hairs stand up on the back of our necks. Whatever that sign is, it will be the first chapter on the greatest scientific story ever told.